Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Los Angeles, California, ever increasing faith with pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day, and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. We are teaching on the subject, the Christian family. And of course, in the context of the title, it's obvious that we are going to be talking about the things that relate to family life. And of course, we will be viewing family life from a biblical or Christian perspective, not as the world views it, but as our Heavenly Father reveals it to us in His written word. Now, every person that is a Christian or a born-again individual, you are a part of the Christian family. Whether you're married or whether you're single, you're still a part of the family. You're just a single family member or you're a married family member. Whether you're male or female, young or old, it doesn't make any difference, you're a part of the family. Now I'm going, we're dealing with this subject of the family, seeking to discover what does the Bible say, if anything, about how we are to order our lives as children of God in the family relationship. Now it's obvious that if we're going to talk about the family, then we're going to have to deal with the husband and wife. We're going to have to deal with parentage, or parents dealing with children. We're going to have to deal with uh, the duties of the husband, the duties of the wife, and then those things that impact upon the individuals in the family unit. And so we're going to be talking about uh, one of the main issues, not only issue, but it is a main issue. It's, it's a problem area for many people, and that's the area of sex. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I want to preface the teaching, or preface the teaching, with a statement concerning some of the things that I probably will get into eventually. I don't know exactly whether I will say anything about it today. It may come, it may not. There is a time in the series when I will be dealing, the whole subject for that time will be the subject of the interpersonal relationship between the husband and the wife, which includes sex. That is a part of married life. And some people have a problem discussing things that have to do with sex in a public situation like this, a public forum. Some people think of it as being vulgar if you should talk about it openly and publicly. Some people think that it should not be discussed. Well, once you become pastor of your church and you have your own television ministry, and then of course you can do whatever you want to do. But I sense a, a burden to share right where we live, and to share with the maximum number of people. Over the years, as we sit behind the desk as pastors and we counsel with people and talk with them, I mean, the biggest problems we have are, are interpersonal relationship problems with people and with husbands and wives. I mean, even with Christians that are spirit-filled, tongue talkers, and tote Bibles around and have yellow, green, and orange pens to mark them with and all that, and yet they have problems. Some of them end up getting divorces. And so somebody has to deal with it. And so we need to deal with it when we have the most people present. Now, it's a lot, it's a lot harder to have counseling sessions with every person on a one-to-one -one basis over a period of time. It would take forever to do that. But we could, by the Spirit of God, say one thing that could affect a hundred couples at the same time and save all that time. So we're going to be talking about these things. So if you have a problem with sex, and you may have children who watch the program because we do have children. I get letters from young people. And so you as a parent may want to monitor this lesson so that if 
You don't want your children to hear about it from the minister or from me or through television like this. And that's all right if you watch some of the movies, the R-rated movies on TV and learn about sex that way. That's okay, but you wouldn't want to hear it from the preacher in the church context. All right, we've already talked about marriage, a divine ordinance. God ordained marriage. We talked about marriage and divorce, the obligation of it. How obligated are you to stay married to your husband or to your wife? Then we talked about uh, what I call another view that had to do with divorce. Another point of view, I believe, that was oriented in the Word of God that I know helped some people. And we've talked about the, or we have been engaged of late in discussing the duties of the husband. We will talk about the duties of the wife. We will talk about the duties of the parents. We will talk about the duties of the children. So we're talking about the duties of the husband. Now, I had actually finished talking about the things that I had in mind to talk to you about. And then a couple of weeks ago, I gave you the opportunity to share with me observations that you might have on this subject while we're dealing with it so that I, we could cover as much territory as possible because I may not cover every area. And there are a lot of things that, that I perhaps wouldn't think about or that the Spirit of God can't get across to me for whatever reason. And so I asked for some feedback from you. So we covered a lot of things that you gave feedback on relative to the duties of the husband. There were a few things, as I said before, that I am going to hold until I get to the area of sex. There are some other things that I will hold till we get to the area of parents. There are some other things that I will hold until we get to the area of communication, because I will be discussing that. There's another area uh, of the division of labor within the home. There were some questions that were given to me relative to husbands doing certain things, but I thought it would be more appropriate to hold them over until we get to that point of dealing with that specific area. So if you gave me one, and I'm not, I haven't discussed it under the duties of the husband, know that I will probably deal with it under one of the other categories, okay? But then there were several things, I started to talk to you about them last time, there were a couple of things that were, well, we've touched on some of them before already, uh, but then there were a couple of them that were a little bit different that didn't really fit into any particular category. And I wanted to deal with those. Now, last time, this, I, I, we left off with this one. Um, it says, uh, Dr. Price, please discuss in-laws, specifically mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relations. If there is tension, should the husband become involved? Well, as I said last time, you better, or you won't have a home. Now, Matthew 5, 9 tells us about blessed are the peacemakers. So a husband could be a peacemaker when it comes to a wife, your wife and your mother, her mother-in-law, not getting along. Personally, I don't think there ought to be any tension. There cannot be tension unless two parties are involved. Now, your mother-in-law may not know how to walk in the Word, but you're supposed to know how to walk in the Word. And uh, it takes two to tango. It takes two to argue. It takes two to have a war. Huh? So if you're not in conflict with your mother-in-law, then there won't be any tension. Now, remember, we're dealing with this subject matter from the highest level. I refuse to bring the level of God's Word down to the level of human experience. But we must ever seek to bring human experience up to the level of God's Word. That is our guideline, the Word of God, not what people are used to. Okay? So, there is this thing about uh, relationships with in-laws, you know. You might, you know, you could have a mother-in-law that's, uh, that's a horrible person. You may have a father-in-law that's a horrible person, you know. So what do you do? Well, you use the wisdom of God. Now, if, if your mother-in-law is not living with you, which I hope she's not, you know, if you have one that's creating some problems, you're really in, really in a bad situation if she's living in your house with you. But if not, then it's probably going to be only a limited amount of time that you're going to have to be involved with her in an interpersonal relationship. And if you know the word, just shut up. Just say, hi, mom, and, that, and let it go at that. If the mama wants to complain and gripe about stuff, let her complain and gripe. You just pray and stay sweet. And then there can't be any tension. Because I'm here to tell you, husband, that if your wife is in conflict with your mother, you're going to be the one to get the short end of the big stick. Because she's going to take it out on you. 
not necessarily in a vindictive way, but she has to have somewhere to vent her tension with mom-in-law, with her mother-in-law. And so you're going to be the one in that house who's going to get the, the short end of a big stick. So if you don't want to be treated like that, then you better be an arbiter, a referee, with the wisdom of God and the love of God and the Spirit of God working, and see to it that there is no tension between your wife and your mother. Amen. Amen. So yeah, I, I would say that yes, indeed, uh, in the interpersonal relationship, and it could be other relationship, it doesn't have to necessarily be the mother-in-law, but anything like that, where you as a husband and it's your wife that's involved with some other relative that's in the family, maybe on your side, and they're having tension problems or potential problems, you better do something about seeing to it that there's peace in the camp, because if not, it's going to affect you. And if you don't want that negative effect upon you, then you better do something about seeing to it that there is some peace established in that home, in that relationship. And you just have some folks that just don't get along. They don't get along because they don't want to get along. But you see, you as a child of God ought to be able to get along with anybody. That doesn't mean you like everything they do, but you ought to, be, you ought to know how to hold your tongue. If nothing else, the wisdom of God ought to teach you how to hold your mouth, keep your mouth shut. Like I said, if you're not talking, there can't be an argument. Amen? Amen, because you, you have some horrible mother-in-laws. You have some horrible father-in-law. You have some horrible husbands. You have some horrible wives. <laughs> some folk, they're just bad folk. You know what I mean? I say bad. I mean, they just, you know, they're argumentative. They always gripe. They're always complaining about something. And if you go down to their level, they'll keep you and your whole household in strife. Amen. Amen. I don't, I'm not allowing any strife in my house Amen. from no in-laws. If there's any strife in there at all, let me create it. It's going to be my strife. If there is anything, it's going to be me and my wife's strife. It's not going to be somebody on the outside who don't even live there. Who do, you know, they don't live there, yet they're going to bring strife in. They'll leave, go back to their house, and me and my wife will be at, at, at each other's throat. No way. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. But you'll have to use wisdom as a husband, as the head of the house, to see to it that that doesn't happen. Because if it does, like I say, you'll be the one miserable. All right. Now. We have another one here. Um, it says, if you have any feelings on the stepfather-stepmother relationship. My husband and I are both Christian, have problems with the child from his previous marriage, and the way he is being raised by his mother. We haven't much control as we do not see him often. Who is responsible before God for this child? Also in the situation, if choices need be made or need to be made, Aren't our children his main concern? He's talking about the duties of the husband. Well, whoever has custody of the child is the one responsible for raising the child. I mean, right or wrong, sink or swim, that's the way it is. If that child is under, under the jurisdiction of the mother, has been a, given to the mother, then the mother is the one that should be responsible for raising the child, for giving an example, both as a, a role model and then, of course, in uh, teaching by uh, precepts. Now, if you have the opportunity to interface with the child, then, of course, you could, you could add something to that. But by and large, the responsibility would, would be on the person or the parent who has custody of the child. That's the way I would see it. Now, <clears throat> the person says, we, we haven't much control, as we do not see him often. Who is responsible before God for this child? Whoever has custody of the child. Now, again, to the extent that the father may have visitation rights or other things like that, then he can be a positive influence using the wisdom of God. He can still influence that situation, but the primary responsibility is the one who has custody of the child. Now, it says also in the situation of, of choices, uh, need, uh, choices that need to be made, aren't our children his main concern? You better believe it. Better be. See, we read it in Genesis 2.24 where it said that a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and they too become one flesh. Well, then any, any result of them becoming one flesh, like children, then the responsibility of that father or that husband should be to his immediate family. They should get first choice, first priority, first consideration on everything. That's the way it ought to be because that's where his responsibility is. It is to the person that he now is married to, not somebody he used to be married to or somebody he had a baby with. Now, understand, again, that, that doesn't mean, let me reemphasize this, that doesn't mean that you can't have 
something to do and that you can't be a positive influence on it. But the husband, it ought to be with the consent of your wife. You shouldn't just go off and do something. Well, I just feel obligated to do something. You're going to take away from your, immediately fa your immediate family, your wife and your children, to go do something for somebody that you already had a chance with before. That's not right. That wouldn't be right. So it ought to be with the consent of your family, your wife primarily, and then uh, your children to the extent that it doesn't take away from them to do for somebody else. All right, Pastor Price, question for the family series. If the husband had other kids out of wedlock and now is married, is he responsible to those kids according to 1 Timothy 5, 8? Remember where it said, they, except they be of his own house, you know, if, if he doesn't take care of those of his own house. Well, see, really, those kids are not of your house now. If you're married now, then whatever you did, whether you had a baby with somebody in a legal way or, or you just made babies to be making babies, uh, the only, the only uh, responsibility that I would feel that you, as a Christian man, you ought to do everything that you can to see to it that that child has uh, the advantages that are necessary in this life, most per certainly spiritual advantages, and you could be a tremendous role model for that child, even though you have a present family now. But again, it ought to be with the understanding, cooperation, and consent of your present wife, because that's where your primary responsibility is, not on anything on the past, not so. Not unless you entered into some kind of agreement with your wife before you married her about the children and about the people in the past. But just all of a sudden, out of a clear blue sky, you say, well, you know what, I just ran into my, my son. <laughs> and people do that. See, some of these guys out here putting babies out and all of a sudden say, you know, you're my daddy. And they find out that they are. Well, I would think that as a Christian, naturally you have the responsibility that you would have would certainly be a conscious responsibility and it ought to come out of a morality of love, but not to the exclusion of your own immediate family. Whatever you can do and whatever your wife will, will agree to, uh, then, of course, you can do whatever you can. And then whoever is responsible for that child also have to be in agreement, too, because it could be a, a person who's very bitter against you and they don't want you to have anything to do with the child. Well, you've got another thing there. But you can always pray. You can always bind the powers of darkness that would hinder. And you can always pray the Lord of the harvest to send somebody to that child because that child needs salvation, just like you do. Okay? So, now... I have a doozy here. This is a goodie. But see, all of this represents the things that people are living with. See, you look out there and all you folks look so nice. You're so nice and made up with your makeup and your hair in place and all dressed up with your three-piece suits. Some of you got on these double-breasted suits. I mean, you guys look great. But you know what? You can be looking at people and they can be going through hell itself. You know? I mean, they look real nice. And they could be carrying loads that are about to break them in half. So the word of God, if it has any value whatsoever, it, can, it should minister to the needs of people where they are. So we're talking about the duties of the husband. We're talking about how the husband should relate to his wife and to his family and the kinds of things that he should be thinking of. And this one came and it's, uh, it's a little different than the other ones that we dealt with. And yet I think it's, it, it could be a problem for a number of people. And I think it's significant enough for me to deal with it. So here it goes. It's called two of a kind. So Dr. Price, number one, my wife and I are members of Crenshaw. Number two, both of us work in the helps ministry. Number three, see, you can have folk in the helps ministry that are leading other people and don't have their lives together or having problems in their lives. See, now that doesn't mean that what they're ministering is not real and not right. See, just like myself, I could be all messed up in my own home. And yet what I'm telling you is still the truth. It's not the truth because I live it. It's the truth because it's the word of God. However, if it is the truth, I ought to be living it. Amen. If I'm preaching it. I ought to be. But that still does not negate the truth even if I'm not doing it. Or not doing all of it to the extent that I should. It's still the truth of the word of God whether I do it or whether I don't. But that's the, that's the reason that we make an attempt. Like some of you, you chafe at the, at the bit when we have the health ministry stuff and the applications and all that because you're not used to that. The average church, you, if you say you're willing to work, man, they'll take you in the first day you get saved or saved or even join the church. That, right that day, they're ready to put you on a deacon board. Huh? Or whatever. I don't do it that way. I, I don't run the house that way because I know people don't always have their game together. And with all that we have and with all that we attempt to do, folks still don't have it together. But think what it would be if we didn't have some kind of guidelines, some kind of rule, some, some, some place for folk to toe the line 
Otherwise, they just live in sin and they try to do both things. And then the church just continually gets that, 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 that epitaph of being hypocrites. Because they see you out there at the bar and then they hear you up here leading the songs in the, in the worship service. They just don't go together. Folk tired of seeing that mess. God is tired of it. And I'm tired of it. And and to the extent that, that I can, and I believe God gave me the, the way to do this, and, and to the extent that I can, uh, it's going to be all exposed. I know there are folk getting away with stuff, but they're not getting away with anything with God. Amen. And it's just a matter of time before you're going to be found out. And it'll come out one way or the other, and you'll be, out of the, you'll be right out of the picture. Amen. Don't have to have a war over it. And you just, some way you just sort of disappear, and you wonder, well, where's so-and-so? Where, where's so-and-so? And they'll be gone. You'll wonder, what happened? Okay? All right. Uh, number two, both of us work in the help ministry, helps ministry. Number three, both of us are not going to leave Crenshaw. We're here to stay. Four, we are doing the best we know how to live and speak the word of God. Now, here's my problem. I was married once before. My first wife didn't know how to save nor how to spend money wisely. During the five years that we were married, I had a job which I made quite a large paycheck. In those years we were married, my pay was so that I could have paid off a $100,000 home in full within three years with no trouble at all. The main reason I never got a home was that my ex-wife had the money spent before I made it. The girl was hell on credit cards. You name it, she had it, right along with it being charged to the limit. She believed it was my job to earn it and her job to spend it. <laughs> Now, I know we don't have any wives in here like that. <laughs> What'd you say, Al? <laughs> now, I know little old sweet Loretta's not like that. Not Loretta. Ah. All right. Anyway. Uh, she sure does turn a pretty color red, though. <laughs> Golly, I didn't know she had that much red in it. Go on, girl. Anyway. <clears throat> Uh, she believed it was my job to earn it, her job to spend it. Whenever I would try to talk to her about our bills, we would fight. None of you all fight, do you? The upshot of the marriage was that we got a divorce. She got everything and I got approximately $8,000 worth of bills. Money was the main reason we broke up. Isn't that a terrible thing to have to break up your marriage over? Money. Think about it, money. It can't talk. Never been to school, not saved, nor filled with the Holy Ghost. And here you are, an adult, educated, maybe, with a degree, and money wrecked your life. And it can do that if you let it. All right, listen to this. I have now married again after being single for nine years and have married a woman from this ministry. I love my wife very, very much, and only because of this ministry was I able to select a good woman to be my wife. Before we got married, I sat my wife down and told her how I felt about money, underline, <laughs> credit cards, underline, my ex-wife, underline, <laughs> and money, underline. At that time, she said, I can handle it, quote, we have been married some time now, and I'm about ready to cut her off from having any money. You might say, why? Number one. I don't think it is right for her to buy just to be buying. Number two, I don't believe in using charge card just because you want something. Number three, my wife hasn't shown me that she has any desire to get out of debt. Number four, I cannot trust her not to use the credit cards. Just about the time I think I got things under control, I get a bill and guess what? She has charged something. Number five, I'm the master of my life, not a plastic card. Now listen to this. This is what he's writing in the letter. Now listen to this. Where she works, they take out $200 a month for a saving plan. What she does is go and charge things and is using the money in her saving to pay the bill. I feel that this is not right for one reason. I do not take $200 extra a month out of my pay just for myself. Why should she? Number six, I believe in not buying or not being in debt. Also, it is very difficult for me to function when I know I owe people money. I can't believe that God wants me to be in debt all my life. Because if he does, then John 10.10 10 is a lie. I will tell you this. 
If it comes down to where the tire meets the road, somebody's going to have to hit the road. I can't live under that kind of bondage. Please comment. I'm open for any suggestion. Thank you. P.S. We are Bible-toting, green-pin-marking, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Lord-praising believers, and Satan has more control over our money than we do. How can God trust us with a million dollars? Well... That's a hot one. Well, I, I, you know, I think that if you, like you said, whoever the person is, like they said, if they sat the person down and talked to them and all of that and told them, and then, they, and then they're doing that, that's really, that's not right. You know, that is really not right. And uh, you have an option, a couple of options. One, you can pray and bind that spin-thrift spirit, that spin-demon, if there is such a thing. And then you can sit down and reason with your wife. I mean, if, the, if, if, you, if she is what you said in the helps ministry, and, there, and she's a Bible-toting, you know, praise the Lord person, you ought to be able to reason with them. If you can't reason with somebody like that, boy, she needs to go get saved. <laughs> you know, if you can't sit down and reason and come to some kind of an agreement on how much is spent. There has to be some agreement. That's a terrible thing for a person to have to live in that kind of, that kind of bondage. And then, of course, uh, while I was reading the letter, thought came to me also that it could be honest. You may just be a little bit oversensitive to this. You know, there is such a thing that you might be just a little bit overbearing about not spending. You know, there's a way to do it within reason. Whatever it is, the two of you need to get together and get into agreement on what you're going to spend and what you're not going to spend so that there can be harmony in the relationship. Because it would be a tragic thing, as he said, it would be a tragedy for you to have to hit the road with all the knowledge you have. And yet knowledge doesn't do any good if people don't abide by it. It's, it's, it doesn't work by itself. But I can't understand a wife that can't, that can't appreciate a husband who, you know, now like the guy's just plain stingy and won't ever buy anything and won't ever do anything. It doesn't sound like that. But I know there are some guys like that. Penny pinchers, cheap, chinchy. But you're not making any goody points in your relationship. And uh, if, if you, like I said, if the man sat down and talked to the woman and told her about all this stuff before they got married, then she should have made a decision. You know, I don't think she just picked up that, maybe she just picked up that demon after she married him. I don't know. But apparently that spending stuff is, you, you know, you either have it or you don't have it, usually. And so apparently you said yes to it and then went on and did something different. And that is kind of a cold thing for you to have a savings account at your job and let them take $200 a month out of your check and then you just spend it to buy a bill, a pay for bill, without your husband's agreement to it. That, that's not very good. I, just, I don't understand people. I really don't. I just, I don't understand people who, that claim to know God, claim to be filled with the Holy Ghost, claim to walk by faith, claim to know the Word, and they can't get together and agree on how to spend some money. Or whatever it is, you know, we're, we're talking about that right now. But I don't understand. I, I sometimes doubt, really wonder, is the person saved? Now, I realize that, you know, you can, you can still do what you want to do. But I really, that's the first thing that I begin to wonder about. Because that spirit that we have been given is, is not a rebellious spirit. The spirit that we receive from God, that new heart, that new spirit that we receive, it's not a spirit that comes from God in rebellion to the Word of God. And why two people, rational, reasonable, spirit-filled folk, can't sit down and come to some kind of an agreement is beyond me. And I hear about it all the time, and I, it blows me away. I, do, I don't understand. I, the first thing I have to think about is I wonder, are they really saved? See, you can be in church, carry a Bible, and say praise the Lord, and mark it with the green, orange, and yellow pen, you know, and answer all the right questions on a form, and be in the health ministry and, and not be saved. You know, you can just mentally assent to everything. Yes, yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, yes, yes I believe in Yes, yes. You know, and yet it not be in your heart. Because if it's in your heart, I can't understand why peace wouldn't prevail in your relationship. I don't understand it. Because you now have a common ground on which you can come. That kind of action should have been before you came to Jesus. 
But now you have a reason for coming together on a level that's higher than both of your own selfish motives. It's the level and the, and the motive that God has. And if you're committed to the Lord, there's got to be a place where both of you can come together and live harmoniously and both of you be happy and satisfied. So I would say pray and then, of course, sit down and talk and keep on talking and keep on talking until both of you come to an agreement that, that you can live with. Are you following me? This is the time when, and I'm going to use a word now that a lot of people are going to have a problem with, but give me a chance to explain it. In a marriage, there should be compromise. Now, see, normally the word compromise is used in a negative situation. The word compromise is neither negative or positive. It's the way you use it. And there better be some compromise in marriage or you're not going to be successful at it. And what I mean by compromise, it's got to be some giving and some taking. It can't just be all your way. That's where most marriages mess up. When they mess up, it's because one or the other wanted it their way and would not give in to the other person. Amen. So disimbue your mind from the usual general idea of what a compromise means. When I use the term, I don't mean that you take less than what your, your convictions might be. But what I mean is that you're willing to yield the thing that you want for the benefit of peace within the framework of the relationship. And without, without you having to go below your own dignity. It's just a matter of let's get into it. What can we work on? Maybe, let's say she's spending $200 a month. Well, let's work it out. You might get down to a place where you can work on and agree on $100 a month. That's what I mean by compromise. Instead of going with the $200, work something out where you can, well, I can, okay, I can live with $100. I mean, I can live with $100 a month. You spend $100 a month, fine, put the other, leave the other $100 in the savings account. That's what I mean by compromise. See what I mean? I don't mean by compromising your convictions. You know, you believe in not drinking, now you're going to go ahead and drink because your husband or wife wants to drink. That's not what I mean by compromise. I mean simply a yielding one to the other. The Bible uses the word submission, yield. Are you following what I'm saying? Do you understand? Because if you don't, you have to. You have to get into an agreement. I mean, there's no way in the world two people can live together without compromising. No, my way of compromising. Understand what I'm talking about now? Not the usual general use of the word compromise. But you, there's a, there has to be a giving and a taking. Has to be. Or you're going to both of one or the other, you're going to be con totally and completely frustrated. And you're going to make the other person so much, so miserable, they're not going to want to live with you. And that little bit of stuff, I love you, I love you, that you first started out, is going to dwindle down to nothing. It's going to dwindle down to, I hate you. I wished I had never seen you. And you don't want that. Because that's not going to do you any good. Are you following me? How many of you understand the way I'm using the word, what I, my definition of what I mean by compromise? I do not mean compromise in the usual, general way that it's used, meaning lowering your standards, lowering your conviction. But what I mean is to come to a point that both of you can accept for the sake of peace and harmony. Because after all, in a marriage, it ought to be more important, the marriage and the relationship and the peace ought to be more important than credit cards and spending. And just like somebody needs to control their eating, you may need to control your spending. Amen. So husbands, if you've got a wife like that, you better use some wisdom or you're going to be frustrated. Give her a certain amount of money and tell her this is it. Spend it all right now if you want to, but that's it. You're not getting no more till next pay time. <laughs> that's what you have to do. You may have to do that, you know. Till, that, till she can get a hold of herself, she may have a compulsive thing to buy. Well, you're going to have to train that thing. It shouldn't control you. Buying shouldn't control you. You shouldn't be under bondage to buying anything. So, use wisdom and deal with it. All right, praise the Lord. I think we are now ready. I think we are now ready to launch off into the duties of the wives. Now, some, some things that we cover are going to be just the flip-flop of the things of the husband. There is not as much in the Bible about the duties of the wives as there are about the duties of the husbands. And I believe that to be so because the husband is supposed to be the head. So he is the main figure. And in terms of that, God places a greater responsibility factor on him. But there are some things, and they are things that we need to look at. Turn to Ephesians. 
the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. Now, again, we will, we will be looking at some scriptures that we used relative to the husbands, but we will be emphasizing the wives part of it this time, okay? Now, in Ephesians 5, looking at verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Notice the term own husband. Your own husband. That's the only man you're supposed to submit to is your own husband. Nobody else. No friend. You're not supposed to have any friend. You don't have no best friend. You have no best female friend. Hmm? I know you'd like to have one. I know she's pretty and sweet and so understanding. But that ought to be your wife. Okay? Wife. Submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, using the very same parameters that I used when we talked about the husband, it works just the same way for the wives. Wives... Submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Well, if the husband is carrying himself like Christ carries himself relative to the church, it's an easy thing for the wife to submit to the husband. Now remember again, this book is written to Christians. Understand that. This is not talking about one that's Christian and one that's not a Christian. You're going to have to use the wisdom of God and you're going to have to learn how to, you need to learn how to walk by faith and pray. And how to use the power of God in that relationship. But I'm talking about God's best. I believe in shooting for the very best. I'd rather shoot, I'd rather shoot for 100% and only make 50% of it than to shoot for nothing and make all of it. Did you get that? Think about that. So you have to have some goal. If you have no goals, you, you're probably going to make all of the goal you don't have. Which is nothing. So I'd rather shoot for the best... Even if I didn't make it, I'd rather shoot for 100% and only make 50% of it than to shoot for nothing, set no goal, and make all of that. You wouldn't be in bad shape. Are you following? You still here? Yeah. All right, well, wiggle your ears or something. Let me know you're still here. All right. So if the husband, now if you have a husband that's a non-Christian, then we're, we're dealing with an entirely different thing there. You have to use the wisdom of God, the faith of God, the power of God. You'll have to pray, and you'll have to make the best out of that deal that you can. But I'm talking about husbands and wives that are both Christians. That's God's ideal. That's God's plan. That's what God desires. And that's what we're shooting for. All right? So if, my, if the husband is carrying himself like Christ carries himself relative to the church, the wife won't have any problem submitting to the husband. It's a relatively easy thing to submit. Yield is what submit means, if you'll remember our definition before. All right, let's look at it again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. So wives, that's your responsibility to submit to your husband, not have your husband submit to you in, that, in the sense of leadership. Your husband should be the head. If he's not, we'll help him be the head. Because it'll make your life what it ought to be. Even though you might be a strong woman, you have some strong women, very strong. And if you give them a half an inch, they'll be the head. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I'm well persuaded that deep down inside, they don't really want to be that. They really don't want to be. But they'll, if you give them the chance, they'll take it. And it's like a fish with a bait, they'll run with it. But they're not the happiest deep down inside. Because, see, that's not built into them. That's not normal. Just like it's not normal for me to have a baby. See, that's not, it's not normal for me to have a baby. Or even have any desire to have a baby. So I'm not built with the kind of equipment that, that lends itself to that. Desire even. And when you try to do something that you're not really designed to do, you'll never really be truly happy. You may have some degree of what the world calls, quote unquote, success. But you'll be miserable and everybody around you will be miserable. Ultimately. Okay? 
So it is, if your husband's not the head that he ought to be, you, and you're a strong woman, help him to be the head. Amen. Help him. You may have a diamond in the rough. With just a little coaxing and a little, little tender loving care, he'd be the man of your dreams. Just the kind of man that, that you want. The kind that you would appreciate. So that you can take the role that you're designed to take. And that's not a put down role. God doesn't put any of his children down. And if God puts you in that, in that place under the man, you better believe it's an honored position. If you don't have enough sense to see it, you're going to be in serious trouble. Amen. Amen. All right. God doesn't make any inferior things. So when he made wives, he did not make them inferior. Okay? It has to do with a positional relationship, not with any uh, intrinsic quality or value that's within that person. All right? He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. Now, look at another scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Again, we looked at this, this one relative to the husbands, but now we're looking at it on the flip-flop side that has to do with the wives. And this is a good one. They're all good, but this is a goody good one. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 7, 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now let me read that fourth verse with a little bit of, of uh, amplification, or paraphrasing if you would. And read it like this, the wife hath not authority, because that's what the word power there means, authority. The wife hath not or does not have authority of her own body, but the husband does. The husband has authority over the wife's body. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. Underline for a time, if you don't already have it underlined that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt ye not for your incontinency. Now, what we're dealing with here is your physical body. So it, it's obvious that God is concerned about your physical body. Are you following me? And it's obvious that what this is talking about is really the sexual relationship within the framework of the marriage situation. And it's talking about that, that my body belongs to my wife, but my wife's body belongs to me. Now, since we're talking about wives' wives, then you need to recognize that your body belongs to your husband. Now, hopefully you have a husband that's willing to walk by the word so that you have a reasonable man on your hands. <laughs> and if you don't, boy, you, you, you really better pray and learn how to walk by faith. But... Wives, sometimes because of their upbringing, because of the, the lack of instruction uh, from the mother or from the home situation or because of a, a distorted view of it, sometimes women have a, they have a distorted view of sex. And so they treat it as, as just a necessary evil as just something that they have to submit to. A lot of women who've become frustrated because men didn't know how to handle themselves and handle their wives, and so the mother became very frustrated when she had girls and she passed that frustration on to her daughters, and a lot of times just told them, well, he's just a dog and he's an animal and you're just gonna have to have his baby, so just get on there and, and get through as quick as you can and just know you're gonna hurt and he's gonna hurt you and then just get through, you know. And that's the, I want to be honest, is there anybody here, any woman that's bold enough to admit that that was something that they, either they, were, they heard or they were told by any of the females in their family? Anybody? Thank you very much, ladies. Appreciate that. And boy, that's, that's a heck of a thing to have to live with and have to overcome. But thank God by the power of God you can't overcome it. But sometimes because the mother had a bad situation with sex and she, she passes that on to her daughter. And some of you have that idea and you know, you just, you have sex to have babies and that's it. And even when you do that, you're not supposed to enjoy it. Not supposed, it shouldn't feel good. It's just something you do. And if you have that kind of attitude, then you're not going to be able to present your body to your husband. See? And then what you'll do, some of you, you start lying in your actions. What I mean by that, you fool around in the kitchen all night long, and you're hoping he'll go on to sleep. <laughs> so if you husbands have a wife like that, 
And you wonder, what's wrong with that woman? Why does she take so long to get through in the kitchen? That might be her reason. Oh, I'm serious. I'm not laughing. That's serious. They'll mess around, fool around, find 900 different things to do, hoping that it'll either be too late or you'll be asleep when you get there, when she gets in the bedroom. Well, your body belongs to your wife. I mean, to your husband. Your body belongs to your husband. Now, like I say, again, we're talking about, you know, the man of God is walking by the word of God. I believe the man of God walking by the word of God is a reasonable man. Amen. I mean, that's, that's me. I believe he's a reasonable man. If you've got an unreasonable man, well, <laughs> like I said, you better learn how to pray. Because you're going to have to deal with that unreasonable man. But ordinarily, you should be prepared and ready for your husband. And of course, again, we get in, and then I'll get into this when we talk about communication. There ought to be some communication. There ought to be some understanding. There ought to be some time set aside so that there isn't surprises. I mean, I, I think it's wrong for a man to be, you know, waking his wife up at 2.30 in the morning and she's got to get up at 5 to go to work and he wants to play. I mean, I think that's very, you know, I mean, that's, that's not reasonable. But there ought to be some time and, and you, you ought to be ready for your man. Your body belongs to your husband. Just like his body belongs to you. But you ought to know your wife enough. And of course you will after you live with her a while. And you'll know your husband after you live with him a while. But there ought to be some understanding. There shouldn't be a pushing off on one just because you want it. I don't really ever want my wife to, to give her body to me when she's not ready to give it to me. There's a quality about it that's, that's, that's so much better when she is prepared. And some men need to learn how to control themselves. You need to learn that sex is not all there is to it. And that you shouldn't just force your wife. And sure, sometimes you're tired and sleepy, but you get into it and you get stimulated. And then, you know, you're not aware of, of, aware of your tiredness so much, but you will be in the morning. <laughs> wore yourself out, you know. You wore yourself out. So you ought to be... You ought to be uh, you know, prepared and, and, you know, you ought to know one another. And she'll, some of you women, you come in there in the bedroom with that funny look on your face, you know, and, and, the, and God, man's red. He's, he's been in there lying in the bed for about 45 minutes waiting for you. You've been messing around there in the dressing room or getting ready for putting your hair up and all that stuff or taking your wig off, whatever. <laughs> Plucking your, taking your eyelashes off and your hips off and all this other stuff. And then you, and, and you, you have that way of telling him you don't want to be bothered tonight. You, you come in, you don't say anything, you just come in the bedroom with that, them old eyes drooping down. <laughs> and you know what that means. She's not game tonight. <laughs> well, again, it ought to be, there ought to be some, some, some understanding. Your body belongs to your husband. You ought to keep yourself up, keep yourself in shape, keep yourself ready for your man. And, of course, I dealt with this with the man. You should do the same thing. Amen. There's some time when she's more ready than I am. I ain't often, but... <laughs> it do happen sometime. <laughs> you know anything about that, Mike? Huh? <laughs> But, now, watch it, listen. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power or authority of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not authority or power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other. That means keeping yourself from one another. Now, some of you prudes... I want you to notice, if you're a little prudish, I want you to notice that it's talking about B-O-D-Y. Now, you don't need your husband's body while you're cooking dinner. In other words, you don't need his body to cook dinner. So it couldn't be talking about cooking dinner, fixing the food. I mean, I don't want to be sure you understand. I didn't write this. The Holy Ghost wrote B-O-D-Y, body. Say body. Okay, so you understand what it's talking about. All right, it said, defraud ye not one the other. See, it's talking about me and my wife, my wife and I. It's not talking about grocery shopping, it's not talking about cleaning the house. It's talking about our bodies. Can you understand that? All right, it says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent. For time. It ought to be something that's agreed upon. 
Now, you're not going to have any agreement if you're not talking. If you're not in communication. Uh, with consent. See? And there'll be times. I mean, I know there are times when, and you, you, I don't know about you, and, and again, I already, I already uh, you know, made my apologies and my preface at the point. I'm not trying to be vulgar. Uh, you know, somebody missing, well, they, they took something I said one time, and, and it was, made me so mad. But I, uh, I repented of it quickly, and I didn't do anything with it, you know. But I was making a statement, and then they wrote the letter, said something about, well, it, it sounds like you're trying to talk about your sexual prowess and all of that, you know. And uh, trying to make a point, you know, to, to help people. I can't, now if I start telling you about Tommy Pickens' sexual prowess, wouldn't you think something a little strange? <laughs> huh? Who else am I going to talk about? Amen. You dumbbell, who will I talk about? I got to talk about me. If I start telling you about what Charlie Brown does sexually, aren't you going to think something strange? Amen. Then you'll write me another kind of letter telling me I'm something else. <laughs> Jack. I don't have to tell you any of my business to prove what I can do or what I couldn't do or what I did in the past. You don't know anything about it anyway. You're not going to know what's going on in my bedroom. So I don't have to impress you. For what? You ain't giving me nothing. So why do I need to impress you? I'm trying to help you. But I was going to say, there are times, I don't know about you, my wife and I, we have an agreement. We haven't had it over the years that we have decided that, certain, that we are at our best with a certain number of days of rest in between our loving encounters. Now maybe, you know, some folk you think you have to go every single day. Fine, I have no problem with that. That's up to you. I've long since gone past all of that. <laughs> see, the great, see, a lot of guys, they break for the tape in the 100 meters. They're, they're finished at the 100 meters. They're wiped out. It's all gone. They've, they've, they've shot their wad. They've put everything into it that they had. 100 meters, they're gone. The guys that last are them 1,500 meter runners, and they got to know how to pace themselves. And they keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Huh? Huh? That's fine if you're a sprinter. <laughs> I used to be a sprinter. <laughs> but I have developed into a long distance runner. <laughs> Amen. And that comes from experience. You find out you just burn yourself out trying to run 100 meters all the time. You learn how to pace yourself, you can run a long time. So we've discovered that it works best for us okay, to have a period of time in between. Recuperate and everything, and then we come together, and it's, it's that much better. Well, there'll be time, and I mean, I know about, I, I can't talk for my wife. I know about me, I'll be looking forward to my times. I got them marked, I, I mean, I have a, I know just when my day, I mean, in fact, after this encounter, I'm looking towards the next one. So it builds up excitement, expectancy, I'm ready, man, I'll be thinking, but you know, I'm not every minute of every day. I have other things to think about, but I manage about 55 minutes out of every hour. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. But the point I, this is the point I want, I, I'm making this point relative to, relative to this defraud ye not. There'll be times when it's our night. It's our time. Well, we've had a heavy day or, ha ha you know, happen to have a, the last couple of days have been heavy with things that we had to do. And I, and I know as much as, my, as, much as my, my body may want, my mind, really not my body, but my mind wants it, you know, wants to, to make love. I realize, hey, both of us are tired and we just get into, a, get into an agreement that, well, we'll forego it this time. We'll just move it ahead, move it ahead another day. Sometimes we've gotten so busy, we've moved it ahead two or three days. But then after five or six days, brother, it's... <laughs> Can I get one amen? amen. <laughs> so, the point I'm making is, is talking right about this. Defraud, defraud ye not one the other. Accept it, be with consent. That's the point I'm making. Don't be so busy that you just keep going on and on and on and never have time for your man, never have time for your husband. It ought to be something where the two of you agree together. All right, defraud ye not one the other, except it be for the fact that I have to quit because I just ran out of time. 
Stay right where you are. We're not finished. We'll continue next time. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette of the message which you have just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on CD or DVD to share with your family and friends. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Apostle Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you the power of faith to transform your life.